Good morning, everyone. This is Tommy from the Ravens Creek Study, and we're continuing in Biblical Theology 1, looking at the kingdom of David. We've been, uh, we've been looking at the heart of David in, in Davidic worship, and uh, we've been noting that the kingdom of God is, I, I guess God calls it synonymous with the kingdom of David. The Davidic kingdom is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the Davidic kingdom. The two are inseparable. That what God sees as the way that David is in himself as well as the way that he rules. All of this, it, it reflects his kingdom in such a, such a prominent way that, that God himself seems to make it clear. You can't tell which one's which. Is it God or is it David's kingdom? Well, it's, it's both. And another characteristic of David here, David was humble, humility. Now, it's one thing to say that David was humble. That We can all say, well, yeah, sure, he was humble. But this is also then saying that God himself is humble. And when you think about, like, Philippians 2, that, that Jesus did not find, it, um, find equality with God something to be uh, sought after, but he became a man. He died on a cross. And, and Paul's whole point here is that we, we should be imitators of Christ in this way, that this should be our kind of humility that we have. And of course, you have the grand story of uh, Jesus in, in John chapter 13, where he washes the disciples' feet. He takes upon himself the servant's robes, taking off the outer garments, much like he would have taken off his glory and, and, and become a man, to become a servant of all, the servant of servants. Our view of humility is often I have the word insufficient here. I'm, I'm going to change that to shallow or it's it's low. We we have um, our our view of humility is often shallow. Moses called himself the most humble man on the face of the earth. Now many of us can read that verse and we can blow right past it. But to stop and to actually think about it, how do you how do you call yourself the most humble man on the face of the earth? Can you really be the most humble man on the face of the earth and then tell everybody else that you're the most humble man? I mean. Doesn't that just make you make you sound arrogant? Doesn't that just make you sound prideful? But that's the point. What kind of humility is it that would allow you to be able to make a statement that is a fact, that you are the most humble man on the earth, and you're not arrogant, you're not prideful over it? It's just, this is the way it is. That kind of humility is a humility that is able to see truth and to not be persuaded that because of the truth you should be inflated that that kind of humility is something that is oftentimes foreign and this is why i say that our our view of humility is oftentimes shallow it's because we think of humility as like that that self-effacing oh no you shouldn't have you know it's when it's when the crowd is clapping too long and you say oh stop but that's not humility. That's only that. I guess it's a it's a um, it's a false humility. It's it's an alternative to humility. That's not really humility at all. Moses was able to demand that the people would drink the golden calf. He ground the golden calf to powder, put it in their water, and said, "Drink it." There's not one person who seems to speak against this. Now, this is this is. Interesting because later in, in the life of Moses and the life of Israel as they're coming out of the wilderness, as they're going through the wilderness, they continuously are grumbling. They're continuously asking whether Moses is truly the one who's supposed to be leading and guiding them. So what is it that when he comes down out of the mount that he has such an authority, even though he is even though he's humble, the most humble man on the earth, how is it that he has such an authority? That he's able to demand that the people would drink their sin. And nobody seems to speak against it. Nobody murmurs. Nobody grumbles. Nobody's questioning his authority. There's, there's, a, there's a parallel here between humility and authority. That just because you're humble, it doesn't mean that people walk all over you. The use of authority is very important. It shows whether... We act from humility or mania. 
How is it that you do act when you're given authority? A false humility would never declare that their opinion is the opinion. They would never say something like what Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. False humility comes with self-effacing. When we think of meek, we think of mild, deferring, quiet, lowly, placid, soft, docile. We don't necessarily think of someone who is able to be very in your face and, and saying to the Pharisees some of the most pointed things you'll ever read, ever declared to anyone, and yet it comes straight out of the mouth of Jesus. How do we reconcile meekness with Jesus flipping tables? How do we reconcile meekness with Jesus saying, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! I mean, some of the most horrible things that can be said about somebody. You brood of vipers! I mean, how do you reconcile that with somebody who is supposed to be kind, loving, meek? But if we think that these words mean, again, someone who is quiet, soft, placid, mild, deferring, never, never looking for the, the, the attention, never, never trying to get in the face of, of anything, but always kind of that uh, off to the side, and, and we'll deal with it when, when we have a chance to be just you and me. But until then, but that's not what Jesus shows, it's not what Paul shows, it's not what any of the apostles show as being the, the characteristic of the kingdom. It's not what the prophets of the Old Testament show as the characteristic of the kingdom. It's not what Moses displays. And all of these people are considered humble. Meekness is obedience. And when we're obeying to the point of even our words being God's words, we have no reason to be apologetic and self-effacing with our authority. So what I want to get at here, if you've ever heard somebody get up into a pulpit and say, I'm going to tell you, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that this is the word of the Lord, this is the, the statement that God is wanting to make, but this is what's on my heart. Or, or you know, there's some sort of like backtracking there. They're, they're backpedaling. They want to make a statement that like, this is important, but they don't want to make it sound too important, lest they sound that, like they're being arrogant or something. That's not actually humility. The true humility would say, I'm standing here as a representative of God, and either what I'm saying is indeed what God is having me to say, or I'm in error. That's humility. To have the boldness to just say it, and to let people decide whether what you're saying is truly of God or not. That's humility. Humility does have boldness with it. And there's nothing to be afraid of with that. And maybe that's one reason why oftentimes those who are truly humble um, are oftentimes the apostolic and prophetic. And that's Maybe that's often why the pastors and the, the church buildings don't like them. Our false piety will lead us to taking the name of God in vain. While being out of sync with, with God and His character, we will all the while believe ourselves to be doing God a service. And because we're doing this for God, we think God accepts it. But that's not how this works. Just because you're doing something for God does not mean that God has told you to do it. And it doesn't mean that God accepts it. And it doesn't mean that it's helping God or anybody else. Just because you saw a need and you thought you can do that, and so you'll go ahead and fill those shoes, and now you're doing it for God. That's not how this works. Whether you're talking or whether you're acting, it doesn't matter. That's a false humility. It's a false piety. True humility is unselfconscious. What I mean by that, you are, you are not even able to recognize that you're being humble when you're being humble. This is just who you are. You're just doing what you normally do. You're just speaking what you normally speak. It's part of what you do. It's part of who you are. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to consider it. And so when somebody says, oh, you're such a servant, or when somebody says, wow, you're, being, wow, you're so humble, or when somebody says something like, wow, you, you always seem to know exactly what to say and when to say it, like none of these things seem to phase you. You're just completely oblivious. It, this is true for all of the fruits of the Spirit. Wow, you're so kind, you're so loving, you're so patient, you're so, you know, 
whatever, gracious. It's true for everything. It is, it is this display of Davidic character that drives the Jew to jealousy. When you can have an unselfconscious, this is just who you are. It's just how you act. It's just how you speak. And this is just what oozes out of you because this is what God has wrought in you. When that is what comes out of you, that is what drives the Jew to jealousy because that is what the Jew is supposed to recognize as being the characteristic of Israel. That when God, when, when God prescribes that Israel is to have a certain way in which they themselves act among the nations and among themselves, it is humble, it is forgiving, it is kind, it has hope. David's rule was authoritative because he ruled in humility. What, what looks like is plastered throughout the pages of the what that looks like is plastered throughout the pages of the Bible. What does it mean to have authority because you are humble? Well, you can look at the way that God talks to Israel, even in the most strict and harsh chastisements of Israel and, and the prophets. God never condemns simply because he's angry. He never just comes in and says, Well, you break a brax and blah 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 blah. He's always like appealing from this is what you used to be. Don't you remember the days of your youth when you came out of Egypt and the zeal that you had? And we were going to be great forever together. You were going to be my people. I was going to be your God. What happened? Why are you no longer going along with this? Tell me, when did I change? And if I haven't changed, why have you? This is always the way that God is dealing with Israel. It's, it is always mercy. And even, even when you go to the New Testament, you see, you see the apostles doing the same kind of thing. And Paul even says it point blank. He says, I appeal to you on the basis of love. Even though he has the authority to demand, he says, I appeal on the basis of love. Jesus reasons from the scriptures with those who he opposes. He doesn't just come in with guns a-blazing and says, Well, I'm the Messiah, so you better listen. No, that's just not the character of God. And so whether it's that we're, whether it's that we're supposed to be the ones in authority over a congregation, or whether it's that we're the ones in authority over a small group of people that we are, we are gathered with, or whether it's that we're supposed to be in authority that because God has said that some will rule over ten cities, some will rule over five cities. However it is that we look at it, whether it's because of the call that we have in the body and therefore a certain purpose and function, or whether it's just simply that we take seriously the words of God. Whatever it is, whatever authority has been invested in you, the way that we rule is through humility. And again, what that looks like is plastered throughout the pages of the Bible. If it's not something that can be apparent and open to you, then you simply have not been looking for it. And we've been too quick to just grasp at, well, this is the way that we know humility. And we let the culture be the one to dictate for us. Humility looks like this. And since humility looks like this, that's the way we act and we call it humility, but it's not. It might be the way of celebrities, but that's not humility. So we're going to continue in the next one, uh, looking at the Tabernacle of David. There's a few scriptures that deal with the restoration of the Tabernacle of David, and some of the charismatic and Pentecostal denominations have taken this, and even the Messianic denominations have taken this and they've used this term in a way that it is not designated. So I want to wrestle that as well. Um, thanks for listening. Until next time, grace and peace to you in Christ.